It is my honor and privilege to welcome Barry Verco, Professor Emeritus of Me Media Arts and Sciences at MIT. Um, from 1971 to 1985, he was Professor of Music at MIT in the Department of Humanities, and since 1985, he has been with the Media Lab. Thanks again for coming for this second interview. Um, also assisting me is Christopher Ariza. He is Visiting Pr Assistant Professor of Music at MIT. He is a composer, software developer of musical tools for live electronics and algorithmic generative systems. And thank you, Chris, for um, coming as well. So Barry, I want to ask you about some um, stuff from the early years of, of computer music, more kind of um, aesthetic kind of questions. Um, the early days, um, computer music research, um, a lot of it, I mean, modernist composers were very interested in that, but there were some other things, um, other interests of some of the, the, the founding figures of, of computer music, like Math, Max Matthews. There were other kind of pragmatic goals. Can you talk about that? And then we'll talk about some of the, 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 the more kind of modernist stuff. But I'm curious about what was um, kind of driving some of the, the original research. Well, it really has to do with control that composers wanted precise control over the sounds they were going to get. And uh, in the early days when I first was in electronic music with analog synthesizers, I worked a little bit with Mario Davidovsky when he showed up at MIT, not at MIT, at University of Michigan uh, as a guest composer there in probably 1963. Um, the prospect of moving from cut and splice techniques, of course, but for which he was the the master, into the development of hardware such as the Moog synthesizer and things would put you in a situation where it was certainly real time, but you would be sitting on stage there tuning these analog, analog modules and sort of having to worry about the tuning because they would float around. Whereas with computer systems, uh, you have precise control over the, uh, the pitch of things and, um, and the um, the pacing of events and so forth, and that's what appealed to me. I had come to this, I suppose, as a composer um, since I had studied with Ross Finney when I first came to this country. Ross, I may have told you before, yeah. had been a student of Alban Berg, and um, he of Schoenberg, of course, so I was into this thing of some kind of control uh, when I just was writing uh, music for instruments. And so that idea, that feeling, sort of came across I, my earliest pieces when I, when I first came here were 12 tone pieces. And when I got into computer music, those pieces also were 12 tone pieces. My clarinet piece, for instance, is strictly 12 tone. We tend to come up with um, tone rows that were harmonics, or more of the Bergian rather than the Webern uh, tradition. I'm still believing in very much in harmony. I'm still very much in love with choral music, which is usually fairly tonal, not always. Um, so the element of control of the medium was something that took me in the direction of the, the computer as the instrument. Mm -hmm. Some of the other people um, seemed like there, were, there was an interest in kind of just seeing kind of what the computer could do with sound. It, I mean, there was some early stuff where they were creating, you know, um, recreations of, 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 you know, tonal music, even some pop tunes and stuff like that. Um, so it wasn't necessarily um, musically innovative, but it was technically innovative. Can you talk about what were some of the reasons that people were d doing that and kind of what their pragmatic goals were? Well, the, uh, the initial fascination of having music performance with, without having to worry about performance um, would be one of the things, so that you could have something happening with, and just be in control, once again, of it yourself. Um, that goes so far, uh, because ultimately when you want to get something that emulates the capacities of an ensemble uh, on one or a number of computers that are working in collaboration. You get into some fairly heavy technical stuff, um, uh, communication between um, different operating systems and so forth, all running in real time with a precision that you really want to be very, very uh, accurate. And um, it ends up, as I learned when I did a live performance of my Synapse for Viola, uh, 
uh, without uh, running from real-to-real um, -real tape, but just having the computer, one computer follow the Marcus Thompson, the violist, and another computer doing the synthesis of the accompanying part in sync with the live violist, where the live violist did have now an element of uh, autonomy over the, the whatever was going on. I began to feel very nervous, not about live performance, but about the performance of the computers, that they would screw up in some way or other. Mm -hmm. So control goes only so far. When you have so much complexity going on, then it becomes almost uh, sort of a big neural system, and you then worry up about the behavior of that neural system. Mm -hmm. I think a, an interesting aspect of this opportunity for control is that the control could be applied to other musical parameters of pitch. The serialists, of course, were interested foremost in organizing pitch structures. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that a lot of early computer music practitioners uh, sort of reveled in the opportunity to control other musical parameters other than pitch. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Well, the earliest computer music that came out of, say, Illinois with the um, Iliac um, string quartet and so forth uh, was not actually f done for pitches at all, that, that is to say com um, computer generated pitches, it was just something, a score, writing a score was then to be played by live performers. And that continued in a way to be the tradition in Europe that you get the works of uh, Godfrey Michael Koenig and so forth and they were concerned about using the computer as a way of composing and those, those pieces were then played by live musicians. The thing that was happening in America, and probably because it had a sort of a technical advantage, was the composers then tended to focus on the computer as the realizing uh, of, of the sounds themselves. And at some, in some cases, the sounds might, in fact, or the sequence of pitches may be, in fact, computer generated. Mostly, the earlier composers were doing the composing themselves and having the computer, of course, then just generate the sounds as a substitute for live performers. Mm. So, um, in the early days, when you weren't, you didn't have a real-time control with the, the, the computer, there's a lot of, of um, significant pre-conceptualization that has to, to happen. Um, and even before the, you know, the era of, of, of computer music, um, there's lots of composers who really valued um, a lot of kind of pre-conceptual thought, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and as computers, we have the, this real-time control. Um, I'm wondering if um, you have any thoughts about what, is there something that might be might have been lost in terms of a kind of artistic discipline that comes with the pre-conceptualization, where you don't get you know you know real-time kind of kind of feedback. Um, mm -hmm. In the same way that if you write a big orchestra piece, mm -hmm. you don't get real-time feedback until you hear the, uh, the performance. And I'm wondering if there's a similar kind of thing that um, with, uh, with computers um, and something that, that might, be, might be lost. Um, yes. With yeah. Well, um, I should, we should append to the word control the idea of real-time or not real-time. So there is control that can be there in the form of how you create the score, what kinds of uh, parameters are in the score that you then depend on technology to realize accurately. But until about 1990, none of that was, in re was happening in real time. So that the idea of going into a studio for 30 minutes and coming out with a 20 minute piece, which was the case, w was a possibility a few years later when you have sort of automation to the point that um, composers are giving up control almost entirely, um, is, is not the situation in, in the early days where composers were re themselves responsible for the score and the computer was just simply realizing the sound. But that was putting the, the sound realization onto some storage medium, typically um, you know, a disk initially, but then c coming out through an analog to, uh, uh, digital to analog converter and recording the sound on uh, analog tape, typically reel to reel. And that was where you then got into something that w you could hear back in real time. It might have taken two hours to synthesize something that took two minutes to then play back. So you have a 60 to 1 computer time to real time ratio, which was pretty common in the early days. Um, so there wasn't the sense of 
real-time control happening in those circumstances. It wasn't until, in fact, the first real-time performance was with my C sound that I took a version of that, that I took to a computer music conference in Glasgow in 1990, and that's the first example we have of something happening in real time, the synthesis happening in real time, where you could now, for the first time, have interaction with it. And that was, uh, that was a huge change, the, <laughs> perhaps the biggest change in computer music to have real-time interaction. So you could, you could uh, have the computer listening to you in real time, um, and vice versa, you could be listening to it in real time and responding. So suddenly you into a situation there where it's rather like live performers listening to one another, and that makes the whole composition and creation thing uh, go into a very different phase. Right. I mean, there, there's real time you know, performative aspect, but there, but 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 the um, the real time um, kind of compositional you know, aspect. Yes. Um, and. Um, do you think that there's um, anything um, possibly lost in terms of the, the kind of discipline that it took um, when there wasn't a real-time feedback with um, hearing sounds that you're, you're synthesizing? Mm. Um, um, I mean, we all see that now that real-time is, is a positive thing because you want to hear it. But I've just, I've, I've just wondered if, um, um, if something might have been lost in terms of a particular kind of artistic discipline mm -hmm. required. Yes, yeah, I, I know what you're driving at. Um, no, certainly if you're um, forced to wait and wait for something, you're going to think about it more carefully, particularly if you're going to have to in invest um, four hours of computer time to hear one, uh, four minutes of music or something, you're going to take a lot more trouble to notate precisely what you want and that is a puts one in a reflective mode and when you're composing and you sort of think about something and go back and revise and revise etc and naturally that's um, going to benefit the piece most of the time sometimes it pays to be very um, natural and um, sort of just being able to uh, do, do things quickly but being able to think about a piece and ref reflect on it is usually a good thing. And so when com the computers were very slow, there was a lot of thinking that was going on. The computers were thinking too, but the humans had a lot of thinking time t as well. And I think you're right, that that did benefit the early uh, pieces. Although the early pieces were not really very exploratory. They were not very uh, innovative. They tended to, to do... Um, uh, simple things. They were sort of not getting into the big sort of massive amounts of sound that the analog studio people, the Mario Dave Vosky pieces for instance, mm -hmm. were able to get into in, the, in that, that I'm talking here about the um, early 70s. And uh, so it took a while for computers to get to the point that they could actually match the um, sound banks that uh, you got from the studio. Right, right. In those um, early days, I'm probably thinking more so of the, the analog. Um, um, there was this, this, this concept of what they called organized sound. Um, and in some ways, it, it, there was this notion that we had a new, almost a new kind of art form that was using sound, but it wasn't based upon you know, traditional you know, parameters of, of pitch and rhythm, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the timbre, um, texture, you know, yeah, well, of course, you had, you had that even in Paris in the early Paris days, of, right. uh, uh, found sounds and, right. and so forth, or the right. work of Yusuchewski or whatever. You right. had a lot of that in the analog um, domains. Uh, and you could have the same thing, of course, showing up then in computer music once you got uh, to the point that you could have the computer modify the sounds that you were working with. Uh, go through and analyze the, the spectral content and shift it around in some way or other. And uh, once those techniques became fairly advanced, that of course was a fun way, fun thing to do, to take sounds and pull it apart using digital techniques and put it together in, in other ways. And so there the computer had another uh, perspective on sound that the analog studios didn't. Mm -hmm. Had you done much work kind of with, the, with those kind of concepts? Um, 
um, either with other composers, you know, in some of the workshops you 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 did with composers, mm -hmm. or your your own work um, with this this kind of organized sound kind of kind of principle. Um, myself, not really. I. Um, I suppose in my synapse piece uh, there was an example there where I took an analysis of, of a string violin sound and, and took it apart and resynthesized it and so that I could play it again in, in different pitches without having a spectral change. And that's the essence of uh, what you could do when you've got phase vocoders and things later on. You could actually make pitch and time shifts without sort of having the munchkin effects of right. speeding up and slowing down. Yeah. Uh, but that took the development of phase vocoders, which was mid 70s, uh, late 70s, before those things became uh, realistic. As far as the opportunity to manipulate sound files in the trajectory of Music 11, Music 360, C Sound, where did these opportunities start to become available? Um, with Music 360, they were not really available much at all. Uh -huh. um, with Music 11, once we had the computer to ourselves in the, in the early um, uh, MIT Experimental Music Studio, uh, we could almost get our hands on things. Mm. And that's when you began to find uh, the r awakening of the possibilities of being able to do something, have, have a greater level of control over the, the digital processed sound. Um, but the real control didn't come until 1990 with this, uh, the first real-time C sound mm. performance, which was at the ICMC meeting in Glasgow, 1990. So you were one of the um, founding members of the, um, the um, MIT Media Lab, but prior to that you had the um, Experimental Music Studio, which started in 1973, and then that moved mm -hmm. to the Media Lab. Um, t um, as, a, um, a, as a founding member, what was your um, kind of understanding of the, the mission of the, the Media Lab? Um, you know, the MIT Council for the Arts was in, very involved in, mm. in, um, in getting that, um, that started. But mm. um, what was your kind of understanding and vision of the, the Media Lab? Okay, well, for me, it was to maintain the kind of autonomy that I originally had when I had my own lab, which I had with the EMS studio. Um, that I had taken, uh, um, I had got by taking over Emma Bose's lab in when I first came here in 1971. Bose was just moving out of MIT, ceasing to do research here, though he still continued to uh, teach. And But I then had a, a, a lab with a computer, and uh, it was all to myself. And I think a lot of the things we did through the composer workshops that you referred to, lots of composers coming in, lots of concerts in Kresge and so forth, was something that just came out of that one institution, the Experimental Music Studio, and we had total control over the kind of music we did, or at least the kind of uh, music we put onto the concerts and so forth. Um, much of it was interacting with live instruments, so that's the tape and instruments sort of thing, reel-to-reel -reel recorded parts. In moving to the Media Lab, there was sort of a pooling of missions and things like that. You, uh, initially, we thought uh, as a group of six people, um, Marvin Minsky, Seymour Pampert, um, um, there were six of us there, Nicholas and so forth, that we were going to learn perhaps to work together and that we would, all sorts of wonderful things would come out of from collaborations. The collaborations didn't really occur with between the faculty. Um, we were each having come from our own beta work of some kind. Uh, the first thing was to move that stuff into this new building and then try to get it running just the way it had been running previously. And that sort of was an accomplishment. The idea of working together, I had at first thought, well, I've never made a film. Wouldn't it be fun to make a film with Ricky Leacock or something? I'll get his help. I never did succeed in making a film. I just focused on the music part of it. And so initially there was uh, sort of six faculty members there, each with their own individual missions. The over overriding mission of the Media Lab, of course, was to, to encourage creative ex exploration and so forth. That was a reality, but that was, so that was fun. So I was no longer having to write lots of proposals to the National Science Foundation. I could write them instead to the National Endowment for the Arts, so I had help with from Judy Whipple doing that. And uh, so we could 
embark on a course of music creativity um, and innovation there with the uh, under uh, the underpinning of the, the technical innovations that we had also going uh, through the uh, work of the graduate students that um, able, uh, enabled us to do new wonderful things. But at the same time it was all in this controlling environment by uh, people at the Media Lab who didn't always appreciate the arts. It was, you know, um, it was intended to be something that was driven by creativity, but the arts um, in their finer form were not always appreciated by the engineers, and one can understand that. Same thing happened at Ericum in Paris. Um, the um, the set, set up there that Boulez was the institution for coordination of um, uh, research and coordination of acoustics and music was the goal. But there were people who had come in as composers. Stockhausen was there. They were the, the leaders, the gods, and the engineers that simply served them. They did their own research, but when the composers were wanting to do things, the, the engineers would be at their beck and call. There wasn't a real collaboration. There weren't people there who really did both, ex with one exception, and that was Jean-Claude Bisset. He was the, the first um, uh, sort of director of um, computing, you might say, and scientific director. Right. Um, and uh, he found the whole thing uncomfortable, and he moved down to Marseille within about five years. And you had him here as a composer in residence oh, yes, later yes, on, yes. which I have a question later. Yes. Um, so this idea of the media lab, the word media, um, that obviously encompasses a lot of things. Um, and it's, um, a lot of the work going on there now is very much kind of engineering based and, and less kind of arts based. Mm -hmm. um, was mm -hmm. that, um, um, is that a drift from some of the original intentions? I suppose. Um, I think we were all being very um, optimistic about the extent to which we could maintain artistic integrity and not be um, having to pay too much attention to technical outcomes. But of course the sponsoring members of the Media Lab would be looking for the fallout that would come from artists have experimenting and generating uh, innovations and so forth. They were looking for the innovations that they could pick up as uh, things that they could take into industry, products or something, where they could get a royalty-free, non-exclusive license to commercialize. And of course those things were more technical rather than artistically innovative. Mm -hmm. So when the um, Experimental Music Studio moved to the Media Lab, um, were there still undergraduate computer uh, music courses or was it, did it become a kind of a graduate um, kind of program? Um, as far as the course is concerned, I usually ran it in, at, at two levels. There were people who could register as graduate students, take it for graduate credit, and mm -hmm. people who would register as undergraduates, taking it for undergraduate credit. It was usually the same lectures, um, but the graduate students would be expected to do more. Maybe there'd be other assignments or something for the graduate students. Um, but insofar as that any graduate student probably didn't have a background in computing music before coming, they were both at the same level in, in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, young, bright uh, undergraduates are just as capable as the, as the grad students, as you're probably aware. And uh, so they were um, sort of all of, a, all of a one, as it were, um, with just a little bit more pushed for the graduate student to do something um, perhaps more innovative or more technical because they were after all going for a master's degree or a PhD. Mm -hmm. Was there a period of time where there wa wasn't um, an undergraduate um, um, you know, opportunity to, to study um, computer music there? Um, is that one of the reasons why the music um, section started um, an undergraduate um, computer music lab? I'm just wondering um, hmm. Was that filling a need for that, or um, was that just um, a, a separate thing that the hmm. music section... Well, it came, um, I, I understand what you're asking, and it came from the fact that in the Media Lab we had established this degree program, and a degree program f based on doing some research and innovative things that would, had to have 
equality um, amongst all of the disciplines that were operating at the time. Um, so we were wanting to make sure that people who came out of the Media Lab had a degree that would mean something, and so that people could go and seek a job. I had some very good students who came through and did a master's with me with the idea ultimately of doing a PhD so that they could become a university teacher. But the, in the beginning, it wasn't commonly regarded um, to have a degree, a PhD from MIT as a good qualification to get a university job somewhere. So I lost some of my best students to go, who would go off then and do a PhD at UC Berkeley or some other place where the university itself and the, uh, the, the programs there already were um, had a, a qualification associated with them. Later on, that idea that um, um, a degree from MIT Media Lab, where the focus there was on, um, I suppose, interdisciplinary, cross, uh, cross disciplinary ideas, uh, later on that became very um, advantageous for the students. So that when the students first arrived, of course, arrived in the early days in the Media Lab with six of us faculty, no two of whom were in the same field, uh, and, we, and we tried to work with, together, as I, I said earlier, but we didn't really. It was the, the students who then found themselves in this highly in, interdisciplinary environment and soon learned the art of lateral thinking. And whereas in the early days of the Media Lab, that was not very valuable outside of the Media Lab, not highly regarded, but later on, as academia moved, I suppose, around the country, the idea of being uh, an expert in, in lateral thinking about, uh, through diff across very diff different disciplines was an asset. Mm -hmm. And very soon, after about eight or ten years, we found that the, the um, hitherto narrowly defined departments were then looking to, to hire our students because they suddenly had this, this cross-lateral um, thinking uh, as, as an experience, mm -hmm. and that was a, a really a big accomplishment of the Media Lab. And that was one of the things that Nicholas Negroponte, the founder of the, of the Media Lab, thought would happen and thought would happen sooner. It took a little while, but it did happen. So in the previous interview, we talked about the, um, the, the, the summer composer workshops that you had done um, and, um, and, and touched on some of the um, the composer in re you know, residencies that you had. Um, that was a pretty exciting time. Um, and then th that, um, that um, died out. Um, what were some of the, the reasons for that? And it's, it's certainly something that I have, have missed. Mm. Um, um, I got tired in the end <laughs> running these workshops every summer. I would be run off my feet for a, a period of six weeks with very little sleep and getting these pieces um, or getting the incoming students all up to a certain level. And of the 30 students who'd come into the workshops, I would then choose about 10 uh, who were sort of commissioned to write pieces for a, com a concert in Kresge, which was already scheduled. We just didn't have any music yet. And um, so uh, that was um, a very tiring period each summer to be doing that with no sort of break than normal teaching during the year. So that later on when I then um, do, did things like went, went off to Paris and work at Aircom for myself for a little bit um, and then come back in the media lab and we were then beginning to get funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, um, then that put us in a sort of a slightly different mode um, where the composers were coming in uh, with commissions. Some of them would come in and stay in, in, until they had uh, finished their work. Some of them would come in, get the feel of the place, go away and compose, and then come back and realize the piece. But always with the assistance of students as technical assistants. In that sense, those students were then functioning like the engineers at Erkham, who would be assisting the composer to realize their, their music. But this then made it um, made it perhaps unnecessary or perhaps, uh, yeah, I'll say unnecessary, for us to be running summer workshops when we were bringing composers in from outside. These composers now were coming in with grants, uh, the, but there were fewer of them. There'd be two or three composers a year who'd come in for a few months at a time and do a piece. And that 
meant that the output came from those commissions rather than from the summer workshops where mm -hmm. people were, in effect, paying us mm -hmm. to write their pieces. Yeah. I mean, there was a period of time when MIT was really on the forefront of, of um, computer music, and um, and I um, I came to MIT in, in 1985, and you know. So you know, and went to many of those those concerts, and that's something that I've missed. And um, um, and I, is there any possibility that that maybe in the future that there oh, may be? Oh yes, some well, I also in '85, I was at the time in Paris working with uh, Larry Beauregard, the flute player that was in the um, you've seen in some of my videos of interactive interaction flute. That's the beginnings of the real time interaction. We right. have a flute being tracked by the computer and the uh, the computer part com computer company being synced to the live player um, Larry was a, a wonderful performer um, as a flute player he'd graduated from um, I guess uh, McGill University and uh, went or maybe it was University of Toronto he was Canadian and then when he got a job straight out of school as the principal flutist in the Boulez ensemble and uh, he'd sort of reached that apex in a way of his career and uh, was looking for something different and was intending to come to MIT and to be in the, in the PhD program and be part of a, in a small ensemble of performances and so forth. Sadly, Larry then became very ill and uh, died of colon cancer shortly after those videos that I made. And uh, I was very disappointed because I was looking for him to be the the nexus of a small performance ensemble that we would have at the Media Lab, just as many schools have resident string quartets or something, would have perhaps a resident um, uh, ensemble. Of Larry would be the, the ringleader, and we'd pull in other players, and, and we'd have then a, a string of pieces that would be written for those particular players. And the students then would become involved in figuring out what it is that is so special about live performance and how computers can sort of synchronize with live performance and so forth. Uh, but Larry was my initial key to that and his passing meant that that didn't happen and I was bitterly disappointed at that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you about um, Professor Paul Earls who had um, been, uh, was an assistant professor of music at MIT and also mm -hmm. a fellow at the um, MIT Center for Advanced Visual Studies. Yes. Yes. Um, how much did you know his work? He did both um, analog and you know d digital yes. electronic yes. music. Yeah. yeah, Paul was from uh, Duke University. Um, he had been active there and then came up to work uh, here in CBS. Uh, I liked his work a lot. Um, it was difficult at the time to integrate uh, CABS and that part of the of the architecture department with the Media Lab. And Nicholas tended to run the Media Lab as an independent organization and not automatically embrace a lot of the other smaller smaller initiatives or other initiatives around MIT to make it one big happy place. So it was difficult for me to bring um, Paul Earls into into the um, into the Media Lab. Just it was difficult for me to bring people in the music department who are studying uh, film music or something like that uh, into the Media Lab uh, as, as uh, an example of um, Academics looking at the evolution of media. There were specialists in the in the music department who were um, um, focusing on things like that, and still are. Right. But bringing them into the media lab, where the the focus to, for us to survive financially had to be on producing, um, I suppose, scientific results, and um, meant that we couldn't be as all encompassing as we'd like to be. Mm -hmm. Did you happen to see the performance of his piece called Icarus? It's this thing called a sky opera. Did you? Mm. Uh, I did see parts of it. I don't recall a lot of detail. I have to say. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. And he did some really interesting things with music and lasers. Yes. Um, and, yes. Um, some interesting sound um, or um, kind of installations. Mm. But I guess on that note, it's it's uh, interesting to think about a, a a role in the form of of computer music that doesn't use live performers has often tried to provide additional visual elements. We have a lot of electroacoustic music that involves video, and there's been a, a lot of attempts to to bring other media in to fill the gap when a performer is not there. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, I know that you've, you really appreciate the opportunities to work with performers, but I wonder in terms of uh, computer music that stands alone, what do you think about this missing visual element? I love some of the music that does is just speakers alone. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of pieces like that. In fact, some of them big four channel pieces where the missing element were, was perhaps the, the lack of human performers and, and everybody focused on looking at a small group on stage was replaced by six speakers all around Kresge Auditorium where you were just involved in this whole um, three dimensional almost because of some of the speakers at the back were sort of coming above you. Um, uh, and uh, for instance, uh, one of the pieces from uh, called In Winter Shine uh, that's on the CD from that um, was just a wonderful example uh, uh, where the composer there was doing some wonderful things about um, meshing sounds together, having sounds or sound banks that were related to one another. Uh, this is Jim Dasho's piece, and Jim uh, was a wonderful composer. He came out of um, Brandeis, actually, went to Rome, and is still in the outskirts of Rome at this, to this day. Um, and his way of making some continuity from the, these, uh, this almost three-dimensional sound and big sound banks of sort of essentially inharmonic tones was to mesh these so that when, you, when there were two sounds that were contiguous, two sound banks continuous. He would have some common tones between the two of them. So you'd hear this one sound, you hear another sound, and it would seem to relate. And you sort of wonder why, because there was no seemingly harmonic relationship. But it was rather like the Schubert um, common tones between, uh, in Schubert uh, modulations. There would be some common tone between the two key centers, and Schubert would sort of play on that. And Jim was doing that sort of thing as a common tone between components of big banks of sound, and it made the things have a, just a great continuity. And, um, but that came from a very determined use of the computer, where he could rely on things being exactly so, and then uh, formed his own relationship between the, um, the sound clusters uh, through that technical means. You wouldn't know that in hearing the piece. You would just feel that, gosh, this seems to be consistent. There's a coherence here. I wonder what it is. And that was it. Mm. So backtracking a little bit, um, um, Jean-Claude Risset um, had done a composure in residency here. And he d wrote an interesting piece called Duet for One Pianist, where the second mm. piano is, is computer controlled. Um, and that's um, an interesting um, aspect of computer music too. And, hmm. um, do you have any thoughts about that? And also, I want to ask you about this um, thing that he put together called Sound Catalog of Computer Synthesized Sounds. It's kind mm -hmm. of a, a catalog mm -hmm. and documentation of. Mm -hmm. Well, that sound catalog predated the, the Media Lab, even. Right. And predated the, the stuff at right, MIT. Right, that was from 1969. That was, was yeah. uh, when uh, Jean Claude was at Bell Labs working with Max Matthews, right. uh, essentially on the Music 5 text. Um, uh, yes, he was an innovator in that sense and really um, catalogued sound and continued to be a, sort of an expert in cataloging sound and timbres and things like that, along with Dave Whistle. Um, when uh, I had worked with him a little bit at Eric Kahn, but he was then at the point of moving out and going down to Marseille, as I said earlier, um, I was quite enamored of Jean-Claude and his, his ability. He's both an excellent musician and an excellent scientist, and you really find that as a combination. Usually people are good at one and not the other, um, but to find someone who is good at both and continues to practice both and not simply lose sight of one of them, which is sort of what I've done, I perhaps think, um, uh, Jean-Claude has just kept up composing and kept up scientific research and I sort of admired that whole thing which is part of why I then uh, had him come here to do a piece. Now, uh, just prior to that, when I'd been at Eric Kahn, I had taken a student of mine, Miller Puckett, who was a PhD student um, at Harvard at the time. He'd been a math major here at MIT. I took Miller with me to Eric Kahn the second time I was there and uh, so he lived at my house and, you know, he was a, a big help in what we were doing, except what he did there was in looking at how I was going about this music minus one thing, the idea of tracking the flute and doing, in the second year it was actually tracking a violin, since Larry Paragard had already died, so I was at this point tracking a violin. 
and doing automatic accompaniment and looking at how um, the computer could be made to respond to tempo rubato performances. And so looking at you know, what happens when two performers are coordinating in that manner. Um, Miller Puckett was in the background looking at how I was putting this together and started to come up with uh, graphical representations of what I was doing. And that ultimately led to something that was called Max MSP, uh, that came out of um, Miller looking at my stuff, coming back here with, with us and doing something, so sort of beginning to, to realize that in a more formal system and then ultimately going back to Aircom and completing that uh, Max MSP uh, work. And it was that Max MSP system that then Jean-Claude Risset used in his um, 12 piece, 12 etudes or for, uh, for one pianist. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a wonderful example of getting into real time. The computer was involved again in, the, in this time, um, not in making the sound, but in simply the controlling the relation between the live performer and the synthesized, that is say, piano, uh, piano controlled uh, second part. And um, Jean-Claude worked out just a number of wonderful ways of controlling what the second piano did. Um, sometimes he would play a note softly on this keyboard and this would do something um, fast, on the, or he would play something loud here and that would do something slow in the second machine. So he had various alternate mappings from one instrument to the other. The greatest performance of that was uh, perhaps when um, we, we induced, or the, well, the first performances were done on two um, Yamaha um, uprights, uh, the recording pianos. But later on, Yamaha came in with two grand pianos, big nine-foot grands, and put them into the, um, the uh, hall, the performance place in, at, at, um, at the Media Lab. And so we had, you could clearly then see what the one piano was doing and the other was what Jean-Claude was doing and the other person, the other keyboard was doing in response. We did a, a re-performance of that work later on uh, in, a, in a concert about 2000, yeah, about 2001 or something like that. It was a concert. Right, that Chris. was a celebration, yes, 25th anniversary. the 25th anniversary, anniversary yeah. We re, um, resuscitated that piece and again got the same sort of feel as just and in recording that we could then of course put one one of the pianos on one channel and another piano on another channel so if you hear that piece uh, through stereo headphones you really get a sense of who's doing what and that was sort of a new uh, wonderful way of uh, uh, of exp uh, experiencing the two piano sort of st stereo effect of one live pianist and one following pianist Mm -hmm. So at the Media Lab, you have worked with a number of graduate students doing lots of different things, not necessarily music-related, but obviously sound-related, but some interesting things about, um, um, you know, sound perception and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, was that um, kind of a natural thing for you to kind of move into some of those, those ancillary kind of Kind of fields with the graduate mm. students? Oh, natural to this extent. It was a natural evolution. I was interested in um, sound and reverberation and so forth. And I took on a former MIT graduate who was at the time working for Kurzweil. Uh, his name is Bill Gardner. Um, I took on Bill as a graduate student. He wanted to do some work in, in um, I suppose, in uh, uh, sound development, uh, particularly reverberation and, and things like that. And what he then got into was something that w you could describe as two-speaker 3D, where you have two loudspeakers that are uh, perhaps at a workstation where you're sitting in front of your screen, you've got two speakers left and right who are then sending sound to you. Um, and um, if you do this correctly, you can actually position this, the sound uh, objects and create objects to the left or to the right by just simply having the sound from uh, one speaker um, that reaches one ear, then cancelled by the other loudspeaker before it reaches the other ear, but replaced by something that reaches the other ear a little bit later, and that gives you the impression that the sound is off to the right. Mm 
uh, way off to the right, something. Or, and so you begin to place sound around the room, 360 around the room, and even overhead if you take into account the pinot effects. And um, so Bill did some wonderful work on that. <coughs> <coughs> I'd initially heard this. <coughs> excuse me. I'd initially heard this um, idea uh, realized at at a, a studio in um, the Roland Corporation Research Lab in in, uh, in Japan, and they were producing CDs that um, could have sounds around the thing. But in order to hear that, you would have to sit on the perpendicular bisector between these two loudspeakers, and you sit there, and if, if several people wanted to hear the same effect and hear the sounds around the room, they would all sit in a straight line, the chair one behind the other, because they all had to be on the perpendicular bisector between the two speakers. And um, that was wonderful. We had, so I had a demonstration CD, but it wasn't a very practical thing to do. Likewise, with Bill Gardner's effect, of having um, these two speaker 3D things work in place and sound around the room. You either had to sit in the, the one behind each other, uh, or if you, were, if you had separate earphones, um, no, you wouldn't have earphones, you didn't want earphones, you just want coming through the speakers. Um, you could uh, <clears throat> be experiencing the same thing, but if you then, um, by sitting in, in, these, in this particular place, but sitting stock still, and not turning your head, because as soon as you turn your head, you then destroy the sound, the um, interval time differences, and uh, then the image would shatter. So the problem there was you had to sit still, you couldn't move around in your seat, and it wasn't a very uh, conducive uh, way to experience music. But then Bill had the idea of having the computer understand what you were doing. So he put a head tracker, it was a polemus head tracker on the... Um, on the user's um, head, so the computer could then tell if you would moved your head around this way or this way, and it would immediately make up, and realize that your head, was, your ears were now in a different location, and so it could do this same crosstalk cancellation, which is essentially what it was, um, and the image would stay, and that was a wonderful piece of work, and so I was interested in carrying on that work. Bill did that as his PhD dissertation. He then graduated in. Uh, 1984, uh, I think it would be. 94. Be 94, yeah. Um, and <clears throat> I needed another person to come in and do something to pick up that work, do something similar, carry it on a little further. And that's when I chose a student who was actually a Boston student, um, but he'd gone and done some work as an undergrad at Northwestern University. He had quite a lot of experience in, in acoustics, and his name was Joe Pompey, and he came in as a grad student with me, and he'd been so, uh, he seemed to be well equipped to pick up from where Bill had left off, and I was quite confident that we were going to get another, the next step in this thing, but he'd only been with me for about two or three weeks, maybe a month or so, when he said, well now I'm here, let me tell you what I really want to do. <laughs> what I want to do is create uh, a loudspeaker that just plays like a laser beam plays sound in one direction. So you could hear it, but you would or you could hear it and they wouldn't hear it over there. So it just and it sounded um, totally unusual because loudspeakers as you know are like incandescent loud bulbs. Uh, light bulbs, they just send their energy in all directions pretty much evenly. Um, but the idea of a loud, of a loudspeaker that worked like a laser beam was something very novel. And this required the sound to be encoded on something that had a much narrower focus, uh, in this case was uh, um, an ultrasound, and if you, uh, the, the degree of spread of ultrasound depends on the ratio between the wavelength of that signal and the size of the speaker. And so by controlling that, by having the speaker rather larger as a sort of flat surface like a pizza box, pizza dish, and uh, having the the, um, the ultrasound up at around 60 kilohertz or something, then you could actually have a fairly narrow beam that was about had a spread of two or three degrees, and the audio then was encoded on that, sort of like an AM/FM encoding on the uh, laser beam as the carrier signal, and uh, then you would then have to somehow decode that. Well, it turned out that um, 60 kilohertz uh, ultrasound finds the air a very unstable medium, 
and it begins to break up as soon as it gets about three or four feet away from this loudspeaker. The loudspeaker was actually a collection of 70 or 80 little speakers about this size um, that uh, were initially taken out of the Polaroid land cameras. This is the range finding parts of the Polaroid land. And um, so they had a high frequency response, uh, good, but almost no lows. Um, anyway, uh, the 60 kilohertz uh, carrier wave uh, was fine. Um, it was high enough to be above the threshold of he hearing, so that it, uh, for human hearing, so it, it wouldn't do any harm to be hearing this. Um, it was even the th above the threshold of hearing of cats and dogs. Not sure, quite sure about crickets and other things, and we never sort of got to finding that out. But um, this idea of encoding the audio on a, on a uh, 60 kilohertz ultrasound carrier uh, was really very novel. Um, and since the um, carrier then began, would begin to break up about three or, feet, three or four feet out from the speaker, what would happen is that the energy that was encoded as audible sound in that carrier wave would then begin to fall out. And as you were experiencing this carrier wave passing by you, what you'd be hearing is the effects of this encoded audio falling out as a byproduct of the carrier wave breaking up. And you would then be hearing this sound just right around your, your head. And um, it was just, it wasn't stereo, it was just single dimension sound. But it just gave the experience of having, being able to hear something for a moment as the, as the beam passed you and then not hearing anything after it had gone by. And that was just a, a wonderful experiment. Now, that is something that I would never have thought of as a faculty member. So for those uh, research groups where the faculty had most of the ideas and the students were there just to simply realize and, and these things, um, they probably wouldn't have come up with something like that either. So I had great faith in the ability of the younger students uh, to really innovate and be creative. And Joe was one of those, and he had the wonderful idea. He's also very technically very solid. And uh, so he came up with this idea, realized it himself. It was a very expensive piece of development, of research and development. But it was one of the best demonstrations we could then uh, give at the Media Lab. And it was one of our standard ploys for quite a few years, and you probably heard that. In, in terms of uh, sort of more in general, as an advisor, as a mentor for these students who were maybe doing things unrelated to your main area, how did you sort of nurture the kind of creativity that seemed to? Uh, uh, well, come out of yeah, your I see. I had one rule, and that was I'll do my work and you do your own, <laughs> <laughs> and that meant the way the student group operated was like this. I would. Um, I learned this from Marvin Minsky, actually. He'd say, Barry, the way to proceed here is you just get a bunch of bright students and you just put them in a room and close the door. And then you just try to give them what they need and then try to stay out of the way. And that was Mar always Marvin's idea of how to um, direct a student group or to um, be a student advisor. It let them be the creative people, in other words. And I had that attitude rather that I would tend to just do my own research and not, and nobody, none of the students did my work. And I didn't do theirs, but I would sort of enable them to do theirs. Now, that, be, that depends on having the right students. And choosing the right students was something that I did the following way. Whenever I would have applications, there would typically be 30 or 40 applicants to come into, the, into this um, um, music group at the Media Lab um, each year and I would go through all the applicants and pick out about 10 that looked likely and then what I would do is hand out copies of not the entire CV but typically the personal statement that these applicants had written I would hand out copies to my students who were staying on and say what do you think of these and um, what they would be looking for is people who would be good office mates, people they could work with or something. And uh, so they would be a large part of the decision making. And in the end, we'd invite perhaps two or three of these people to come by for interviews and they would take them out to lunch and so forth. But it was the students who basically chose their colleagues. <laughs> 
from year to year. And that has given rise to a, um, um, an alum collection from the experiment from the studio there in which everybody just likes everybody else's work and they remain friends. They meet every, you know, a couple of times a year for a beer or something like that. They remain very good friends and there was never any real sort of uh, conflict or, or uh, should I say, competition between them. They were all doing work that they respected uh, of each other and um, they were, have all remained very good friends. And I've found that, for the most part, they were right. I might have chosen other people when it came. There was only one instance where I overrode <laughs> them. And I said, no, I think you're wrong. This is the person that, and that was when um, a student by the name of uh, Paris Maragdis, who had come out of UC Berkeley, not UC Berkeley, Berkeley College School of Music across the river here. And he didn't seem to impress everybody or anybody. And they thought, oh, he'll never make a researcher. And I, I overrode that. And I said, I think you're wrong in that. I think Paris has the makings of a researcher. It turns out, that Paris has been one of the best researchers we've had in the in the in the media lab um, for the work that he did on um, blind source separation and things like that, where he really had an insight into how sound worked. As a musician, uh, he was um, you know, had a, a great ear for that sort of thing. Um, didn't have a large background in in mathematics, but was very adept and quickly picked this stuff up and uh, turned out to, to be a, a wonderful member of the group. Uh, but he was the only person that I chose. Everybody else was sort of self-chosen <laughs> by the group, and uh, I think it, it did work out very well. Mm. So I um, want to get into, um, give you a chance to talk about um, Sea Sound. Uh, that's <coughs> one of your you know, lasting legacies. Um, and um, we're coming up on a break here soon, but do you want to talk about um, kind of the, the the origins of sea sound and, and um, you know and, and how it's related to the earlier mm. um, stuff you yeah. were doing. Well, it came about in a couple of ways. First of all, um, in the early days of the studio at MIT here, the Experimental Music Studio, we decided uh, to install Unix as our operating system. Now, everybody else in the in, at MIT was running a thing called either RSX or RT11, which both were operating systems from a digital equipment corporation. If they had digital machines, they were running RSX and RT11. And I decided to switch to Unix in the very early days of the studio uh, because in, I was interested in the, this, the structure of, uh, of C, which was the language in which you use uh, index. So it was C and, uh, and Unix, where it sort of came together as a package. And that enabled me then to write C sound a bit later. But the first thing was to establish Unix as the operating environment here. Um, now, that initially put us out of step with the rest of MIT, because the rest of MIT was able to send messages to one another, you know, e early primitive email sort of communications and so forth, using RT11 and RSX communications. And it just wasn't connecting to Unix at all. So to have the right idea at the wrong time is not always a good idea. <laughs> so we were sort of off by ourselves. And I had signed, I signed the initial agreement between MIT and Western Electric, which was, had been handling the, the uh, patent things of, of Bell Labs, Bell Telephone Labs, for the Unix uh, environment. And uh, so for a a year or two, I was the only signature on this thing. But later on, when the rest of MIT began to see that Unix was the, the thing to go with, then they just simply appended their own signature. So, but I was sort of the, the initial Unix thing here. Now, that had me working fairly closely in, in, um, in C um, to begin with, but I was still running um, Music 11 because on the, the PDP 11, even though we were running Linux, I was, uh, Music 11 was running um, in assembler language, so it was RT11, no, sorry, it was uh, PDP11 <coughs> assembler. And um, so I was cranking a lot more speed out of the, the machine, a lot more com compute power out of the machine by st sticking to the assembler language. I had done the same with Music 360, that was all assembler too, and could beat the, the Fortran equivalents by a factor of about four or five or something like that. So in the days when computer time was very expensive, 
Um, that was a big advantage for, for a composer to get five times the amount of music out of running um, the Music 360 assembler version of what later became Music 5 or Music 4B, which was the the no, 4BF, which was the Fortran version of uh, equivalent to Music 4. Um, so coming from the PDP-11 um, assembler um, version, sort of a version of C sound, with the one difference that I established in, in PDP-11, in, in Music 11, the idea of control signals. In Music 360, everything was running at the same audio rate, controls and everything else. In PDP-11, uh, um, writing Music 11, I decided to establish another um, network, I suppose, internal network of signals, which were the control signals. And um, they were, I gave them little names of K something. So audio signals were ASIG and control signals were KSIG, where SIG might be some other name. Um, that I actually got from Don Buchler. Buchler's synthesizer was different from the um, Moog synthesizer, and that B B John, uh, Don Buchler had two classes of patch things. These were both analog things, but two classes of patch um, chords. Uh, one of them were audio chords, and then the other color was control chords, control signals. And so these control signals actually controlled the analog oscillators that were putting out um, uh, you know, full frequency um, audio signals. And so he had control structures and audio structures. And I thought that was a great idea. Um, Don Buchler's synthesizer never made it to prime time. It was a very interesting thing. There was a lot of the, these things around at the time. A lot of music came out of that, but never became as popular, perhaps, as the Moog synthesizer. But I thought the simplicity of having control signals and audio signals was a really amazing step forward. And the, the beauty of Don's system was that it really did recognize whether Don knew this as a, from a sign standpoint or not, recognized the difference between our perception of frequencies and our perception of envelopes. Uh, envelopes operate at a different rate. Um, we can only hear like 20 consecutive sounds or 15 or 16 uh, sounds uh, as independent entities before they then become start to become pitches, and um, that's that depends on the rate at which neurons can or the envelope sort of detectors can actually uh, res be reset and, and accept another sound, and that's a very different thing from perceiving pitch, which is we're sort of now looking at how um, uh, things. Uh, operate at a different at a different speed. Now the fact is, with pitches, we don't really hear the pitches because the neural rates in the auditory mechanism don't exceed more than about a thousand times a second. So we're not actually hearing anything over a, one kilohertz. Um, what's happening is it's energizing the part of the sensory mechanism that we associate with those higher frequencies, but the, the energizing is not active, actually making those things fire at that rate. And so there's a difference between the way the, the auditory mechanism detects envelope shapes and the way it detects pitch structures. And Don, whether he knew that or not, as an engineer, he possibly did, or sensed it in some capacity, uh, had neatly divided these two things. And I thought that was a nice division. So when I came to write Music 11, I actually put in this other level of control, which was the, the uh, control signals that, that would control audio oscillators in the language. Now, throughout that, in writing Music 11, I had um, had various experiences when I was writing Synapse of the shape of envelopes and so forth that Initially, our idea of an envelope was sort of like a piano envelope that would sort of rise and then naturally decay, whereas I think I may have told you before, um, my violist could actually have much more control over the steady state of the note. And so I then came up with different shaped envelopes that would rather emulate what string players and wind players could do that pianists ordinarily wouldn't do. So that gave rise to a different kind of um, control signal requirement anyway. But in writing all of the stuff, 
I, I would write this, these things in assembler language, as I said, for speed. Um, and I would carefully document with little um, comments to the side, you know, add this to this or whatever it is. And I'd, so I'd, I'd had this my own um, notation for documenting what was what was wasn't so apparent in the sim language. It was a little bit obs uh, obtuse. Um, but uh, when it came to writing, but, but I should say that the the documentation was fairly complete. It'd been isolated. Everything would go. The filter, everything was was encoded, and you know, four times the square root of this or that, or whatever, was all right there in the comments. So what? How did I write C sound? I basically took Music 11, deleted the assembly language, and compiled the comments. <laughs> And that was about it. Um, there had to be other changes, of course, but that's sort of how I got into the C version because it turned out that my comments were largely C-oriented, C-based. So C is a natural sort of set of um, symbols and uh, operations and things, and um, that's worked pretty well for my. So I had to do a little bit of tidying up, but that's sort of how I got there. That's not giving C in real time, not real time C sound. That was a later thing that required computers to get a bit faster before that could happen. But that's how the early version of uh, C sound actually came into existence. So were you able to get the performance with that move to C that you had with the assembler code? Or close enough? Well, I was on a different machine now because I was actually moving on to, well, I was still on the PEEP 11, I should say, the floating point processor, yes, but I was moving towards um, a VAX machine, which is where uh, that had a lot more speed. The mm. PDP-11 at this point we'd had was given to me by Digital Equipment Corporation in 1972, and we're talking now about this thing happening in 1986, 87, when I think it was around that period that we um, took a... a um, of, uh, were, uh, took um, delivery of a VAX machine. So by the time we moved to the Media Lab, which was 1985, um, yeah, we already had the VAX, I guess, then. So the VAX had come along. So we actually moved the VAX into the Media Lab along with the PDB-11. PDB-11 stayed on board, stayed online as a generating machine for another decade. It was an amazing piece of equipment. Best machine that um, digital equipment ever made, the PDB-11. That was um, uh, all due to um, Gordon Bell, who was the innovator there. PDB-11 had been um, his sort of invention, the, the Unibus that was was based on, um, had been Gordon Bell's uh, innovation. And he then became the director of engineering at DEC. But that work had been done actually, I think, at MIT here. Mm. And then the move to real-time C sound uh, happened. Uh, you talked about using it yes. in the, by 1990. Mm -hmm. 1990. That was the first um, demonstration of that. So all I had to do there was to replace the circular um, flow of control, uh, and in both. Um, music 11 and in C sound, there were control signals. There's one pass through the code at the control rate, looping through the code at the control rate, and then each time you got to an audio generating signal, it would put out an array. So it was array proce processing the audio signals, and then sim single, single step, uh, well, single integer or, or um, uh, part of the audio signal. So there would be one audio word would come out and then an array of words of, of uh, the audio signals. Um, and that loop then was just, you know, would go as fast as it could. If you had a big heavy piece of music, then it would sort of slow down and would gradually, but it was just writing onto a digital disc anyway. And it wasn't attempting to be um, in any particular rate, except just to be true to the score. Um, what I did in real-time CSound was then put a um, a monitor in here, in the in this loop, uh, 
that would constrain how quickly it got back to the to returning to the top of the loop. And that was like having a a governor on a car. If, if you know what a governor on a car is, it mm -hmm. sort of present, pre prevents it from going over 50 miles an hour or something. This is what the, the car rental companies used to do. <laughs> um, so I had a sort of a governor here that would be just waiting on something before it would go back. And, and now this something, waiting on something. The something was the um, ability of the DOA, DOA converter to actually empty out a block of uh, buffered sound. And so this was essentially writing to the, to the DOA converter sort of, and blocking on the output. Mm. So it would be waiting on that. And as soon as we delivered another block of sound, then it says, OK, back to the top and do it, generate some more. And there'd be typically three or four buffers that would give you a little bit of take up in case you got behind on the, uh, on the sound generation because sometimes the big heavy things might have been slower than real time. But in general, you, by using this buffer, um, the buffer of two or three buffer blocks, you could actually keep going with fairly complicated uh, signals operating in real time. So that's basically what I did for real time. C sound was just insert these little sound buffers in there. Uh, waiting on the output, so it was it was uh, buffered or on, it was blocked on I/O, mm -hmm. and so you're just writing in that, and that gave real time C sound, and that's all. So I didn't have to do much there either. Yeah. Um. So with um, aside from the the, the real time thing, um, were there um, particular musical um, problems that were kind of underpinning kind of what, um, how you structured C sound, and the fact that you had you know the, the separate audio and control signals, that gives you a certain kind of control over the kind of sounds you're you kind of you're trying to create. But um, you know the, the the what's talk about some of the underlying kind of musical um, premises for some of the the the, um, the engineering work. Hmm. Uh, um, the idea was to first of all produce very efficient oscillators and filters that were capable of running in real time and not simply taking so long to deliver sound to the output that the buffer would empty out. So um, each um, orchestra uh, comprising a number of instruments or so that may be all operating at the same time or somebody, or perhaps just one instrument at a time or whatever, each orchestra would have this finite limit of how much it could get done before the um, the buffers would empty out and you'd, and you'd get a stuttering effect and when it, the DAC would repeat a buffer before it was refreshed with a new block of sound. And that was sort of da 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 you actually you could tell when the, it was getting behind uh, real time. So that meant that um, we just simply had to make it very efficient, a very efficient orchestra, and so it stayed in assembler. Uh, or in the case of C, uh, the beauty of C languages, as opposed to other high-level C++ and other level uh, other languages, that C was running very close to the hardware, and I was sufficiently familiar with what the compiler was going to do to my C code to know what assembler it would generate. And I would use this opcode as a, or this, this C structure instead of another C structure because I knew that this one would actually run faster. And so with, by keeping an eye uh, uh, um, open for things like that, you could still cram a lot of speed out of this thing. Now that's just dealing with technical things. But the idea of getting into something that was now real time meant, as I was saying earlier, uh, suddenly you had an interaction with the computer uh, at the speed of the piece that was being played. And that meant, first of all, that the computer could listen to your input and exert another element of control over this looping stuff. So it wasn't just simply the sound being buffered to, to um, through through these buffer blocks, and that sort of was controlling the rate at which it went through the piece. But the rate at which the events of the piece occurred, in other words, the tempo of the piece, could be then controlled by something else. If the tempo was slow, uh, 
of course, um, you, when you slow the tempo down, then there would be more buffers um, of output on this particular one note because we're now operating, playing it slower. And then if you speed it up, there'd be a fewer buffers, of course. So the, 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 the digital to audio conversion was still the only clock in the piece, in, in the whole system. So the DAC was the clock that controlled everything. But over and above this digital audio rate, uh, you could then uh, impose any kind of uh, tempo that you wanted. And the tempos were running asynchronously with the digital audio uh, conversion rates. So that was the fixed rate. And then over and above this, so once you'd, you had a fixed rate that was con giving continuous sound, you could interact with that. Then you could do things like uh, tap a tempo or something and have the music uh, um, responding to some tempo that you wanted it to do or have the computer listen to somebody playing something uh, or tapping on the disc. In fact, the first um, demonstration of real-time C sound, which was done at this ICMC in Glasgow, had one of my students, Dan Ellis, who's now teaching at Columbia, uh, he was Dan was an amateur percussionist, and he was just tapping on the on the the desk here, and the computer was figuring out from his tapping what the tempo the the tempo was. Now that was an interesting musical challenge to have a computer have a sense from almost random tapping or unstructured, should we say, largely unstructured ta tapping on the desk. You know, just do my nothing that was previously scored, somebody just tapping and, you know, when you and I hear somebody doing that, we infer from that a certain tempo rate. Now, how do we do that? Well, the tapping is coming along in some sort of little patterns of dum da da dum da da dum or whatever it might be, and you infer from that this is sort of a metric. So the idea was to have the computer able to infer a metric from some semi-structured input uh, as you and I might when we were listening to some somebody just tapping away, and then for the computer to use that as the tempo um, uh, required of the piece that it's actually generating. And that gave Dan Ellis then the ability to speed it up and then slow it down just from by increasing his inferred tempo rate in his random input. Mm. Now that was new because we'd never had anything like that. Previously, if you wanted to speed up, you'd sort of use a potentiometer and, you know, just jack it up or pull it down. Um, but to be able to just do it, control it from essentially musical input, musical uh, um, event input, was a new thing. And you could only get into these things when you're in real time. There was, you couldn't do anything realistically with that kind of input before it, real time. Oh, you could, I suppose, and it would, just come an, it would become an academic exercise. But once you cross over the real time threshold, then you're into the real real time interaction and that turned computer music into a very very different thing mm. so the demo that we put on we gave at uh, the icmc in in glasgow 199 i believe it was 1990 just put computer music into a totally different domain and that was a big breakthrough mm. so chris you had some other questions about um, max msp and, and c sound and yeah sure i mean the um uh, the uh, uh, interface of C sound and the interface mm -hmm. of computer music languages, mm -hmm. I think, is a is a really interesting question. Uh, you mentioned uh, Miller's work and the development of mm -hmm. Max MSP, yes, and, yes. and of course, uh, there's PD as well. Mm -hmm. um, these visual programming languages offer uh, this visual analog to yeah. the old patch bay, yeah, yeah. Um, and you provide a certain level of accessibility. Whereas yeah. text-based languages offer us a certain amount of power. Mm -hmm. I wonder what you feel about you know, these visual programming languages mm. and what they offer uh, computer oh, musicians? Well, I feel they're a great addition. I've never got much into it myself. I've just left that to others, and that's been just fine. Mm. So the various people have come up with front ends for um, all sorts of things, front ends for Music 11, front ends for C Sound, etc. And I've been happy to see those things uh, happen because they have given the users a much more um, intuitive sense of what uh, what's going on. Mm. And I don't... Um, have any negative feelings about that at all. It sort of increases the user base and the ability of people to actually work with the material. I have stayed rather true to the integrity of the code underneath that does the sound generation because I've always regarded the uh, 
quality of that sound is being uppermost. And uh, you can only get that by focusing onto those things and not getting too distracted with whatever the, um, the pretty things are on top. <laughs> I prefer to get my kicks from the beauty of the sound that comes out mm. rather than the, the um, fancy sort of front ends. Yeah. But I do agree that those things have been um, really a great addition mm. and it's been great. Um, at a certain point, the the licensing of CSUN changed. Uh, maybe it was five or ten ten years ago or so yes. in that range, and became an LG peeled uh, yes. license uh, yeah. uh, system. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that licensing change and how that sort of promoted yes. the growth or distribution of CSUN? Yeah. Well, um, all along, I had had the habit of just making all my code public. And uh, Music th um, 360 in the beginning, I would be mailing off, running out of the post office every second day and mailing, out a, mailing off a 360-foot, 360-foot reel or 300-foot reel of tape to people who wanted to be running um, uh, Music 360. Um, and the same was true with PDP-11, um, the, the uh, RT-11, not sorry, RT-11, the Music 11. Um, I would happily give people access to these. In that case, I was able to send it over the, uh, the internet, and so that was a lot easier than running down the post office with a 300-foot reel of tape to mail off to somebody. Um, so I've always given things away. So I was quite happy for people to be adding, when they got hold of this, to be adding their own things. Jim Dasho, for instance, even in Music 360, um, Jim Dasho wrote his own opcodes. He's the only person, I think, who's ever done that. But he was sufficiently into the code and able to sort of envisage some new thing that he wanted that I hadn't supplied. And he would sit down and figure out how to write the new opcodes, which was amazing, in assembler language, you know, 360 assembler language that was, that was written in. And um, yeah, Jim's the only person who, to my knowledge, ever did anything like that. But I was happy to see him do it and add his, and just enrich the environment to, to his own needs. And people have continued to do that. With uh, Music 11, they would sort of write other things, not only front ends, but actually get down and write sort of new operations down at the guts of, uh, of things. And uh, that continued to happen with C Sound. Um, people wrote front ends, and also people would add opcodes. It got to the point where the composers who were writing opcodes were doing it in response in response to what they felt their own needs to be. I should say that in the case of the expansions of Music 11, new opcodes there that came rather out of my summer workshops when people would say, oh, I'd really like something that did this, it doesn't do that. OK, I'll, pr I'll do it for you, and you'll have it tomorrow. Uh, or in my own case, I needed something that did this a little differently. So it was usually these opcodes would come out of um, the creative need to uh, solve a problem that you'd sort of confronted yourself with your own fault, but you had to solve it somehow. So you would typically come out with um, uh, another opcode that would solve the, do this the thing. Sometimes it might be just a case of efficiency. You could, with the existing opcodes, do this whole, create the structure that would solve the problem, but then it was too slow to have all these things up. So you would write one opcode that did it all efficiently, where all the sort of the, the minor details were inside a single opcode and could be all done in assembler as opposed to passing like a bucket brigade between opcodes. Um, and people were doing this through the 90s in fine style um, and then were generating pieces and putting pieces on concerts and then wanting these pieces to be recorded and you know that was just fine by me since I had no um, qualms about them recording their own music etc. But they began to be concerned because um, C Sound um, had an um, NSF written all over it. That is to say, I had some support from the National, National Science Foundation to be to be writing that early stuff. Even though, as I said, I just simply compiled the comments. Um, <laughs> there was some support from the National Science Foundation, so it, it had to be. Um, with you know a reference to National Science Foundation, and maybe there was some there was concern, there was some reservations about that. To what degree were these things that people were now putting on top of my C sound uh, were they owned by the composers? Was their piece now owned by the National Science Foundation or whatever? And uh, it was a legitimate legitimate concern I felt, and so.
by moving to an LGPL, sort of a um, more um, open source or a, a, a more available um, um, agreement, um, then people felt that they could actually write and produce pieces and write their own additions to this thing and proceed and without little concerns about um, suddenly violating some rules somewhere. Um, once you do that, of course, you then open up the thing to um, to all and everybody to start adding things. And sort of the community of sea sounders around the world, of, that I was, I'm always amazed at how large that has become through the the uh, push that has come from um, Rit Boulanger over at um, Berkeley and lots of other people around the world, who've been John Fitch in England. And, um, um, there's a huge community out there, so there's a there's a sea sound community, and naturally everybody wants to be in there and adding their own little opcode or something or other. And there was nobody really riding herd uh, over that, um, unlike in the case of of uh, Linux, where Linus would say he'd, he'd sort of act as good cop, bad cop or something, and say yes, we'll accept that, we won't accept this, and that sort of kept the lid on somewhat. C sound got a little bit out of control. I wasn't controlling it, and the people who started out controlling it, notably John Fitch at uh, Bath, University of Bath in England, um, gave up control. He was a math professor and he had other things to worry about. Mm. And uh, so that the public C sound became quite uh, increasingly larger. And uh, that eventually leads to software bloat. That system has become just too big to be maintained or to be useful on a small machine or something, fine on a great big Intel machines these days, expensive machines. But if you wanted to get into smaller machines that you wanted to use in concerts and having several of these communicating with one another, a big system like that becomes a bit of a liability. Yeah. And um, so I was happy to see it happen uh, under LGPL that people could do all this stuff. But I always maintained my own version of my sort of private version of CSound. So pub this public version public C sound and my own version of C sound, which is what I was using for teaching over here, was something that I could more easily teach the classes with. There was a limited uh, variety of things that people could do when they were just learning about this stuff. And I've been happy just to run my own ship, as it were. And it's just like doing my own research, as I said earlier, doing my own research and letting people, other people do their own. <laughs> and never the twain shall meet, or well, they didn't need to. And so I've just let the public see sound just go along on its own course, and I've sort of maintained my own thing. Now, the disadvantage then is that I haven't had the use of some of these other interesting innovations that have come by, and I haven't tried to emulate any of those things. A couple. But generally, I just kept, sort of kept to my own more constrained environment and um, s s uh, selection of opcodes. Mm. And uh, so... I've isolated myself, I suppose, in that sense, that I just haven't wanted to get involved in these other things. But it has meant that my own little version runs easily on some very small machines, uh, like the XO um, for um, the one laptop a child thing. And so I haven't sort of been too concerned. There's certainly a lot of flexibility and enough power there for the kinds of um, simpler examples of computer synthesis that would come up on mach small machines. Yeah, the uh, one of the amazing things about C Sound is that it runs on nearly every platform and continues to run on every platform and has mm. been used and embedded in, in many, many different things. Mm. Uh, the one you mentioned there, the one laptop per child program, when I first uh, saw that there was C Sound in that, I thought that was that was just amazing. It also has a novel uh, patchable front end as mm -hmm. well, which mm -hmm. um, I, I was interested to see. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the idea of giving synthesis control in a, a system like that and the ability to synthesize music to a device that was initially intended, if I'm not incorrect, to uh, children in Africa, really, yeah. and around the world. Yeah, well, um, you then run into another uh, set of goals. The One Laptop Per Child was indeed created by Nicholas Negroponte as a, as a an, with the objective of providing inexpensive computing for disadvantaged children around the world. Initially this was Rwanda, uh, 
in the middle of Africa. And later Rwanda sort of fixed itself, but there are certainly other, many, many other uh, communities of kids around the world that are without advantages, a lot of them being in South America and Peru and so forth, um, um, where um, the government has seen fit to purchase large numbers of these XO machines for the kids in the r very remote areas. Uh, I took some of these XOs initially down to the South Pacific, which is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, initially it was to the Solomon Islands. I had a friend there, uh, someone I met online basically, um, and uh, he was asking for some XOs and I managed to get hold of 30 machines and I sent 30 machines down to this person, David Limmy. He was a, an English Englishman who has been teaching in um, the Solomon Islands, in fact married a Solomon Islander, and they've got a family there, and David's an excellent teacher, but also was getting very interested in, in the technology. He's not a composer, um, but getting very interested in the technology that um, could enable the children of the Solomon Islands to get into, into have a different environment for learning. And uh, so I sent him uh, 30 machines, or 35 machines I think it was, and after six months I got on my bicycle and went down there and looked, uh, went to see what was hap happening. I had asked David to put these machines in the most remote place he could find, you know, where the children by implication would be the most disadvantaged, cut off from the rest of the world, um, and he did that. He put a and put them in a, an island of Putukai, which was way off to the western part of the Solomon Island group. And um, when I got there, um, landed in Oniara, I then took a three-hour boat ride on a sort of river launch kind of thing around some of the islands and got to this remote island and then from that one wharf then we took a dugout canoe for another hour and eventually got to the school where they had some of these XO machines, the first XOs being deployed in the South Pacific. Um, and I went to see the, uh, the school, David was with me, and, um, and encountered the school here where um, Elna, who was the teacher, a very good teacher actually, it was totally in command of what was going on. She had all the students all sort of sitting there along a, uh, on either side of a desk, a um, long desk, and um, they were just working quite their way. She was window dressing, I mean, which she knew I was coming, and so she had all these students that were sitting there. They were all about all 14 years old or something like that, and uh, both, you know, boys and girls. And I said, Elna, that's fine, but let's take um, half of those kids out and let in a lot of little kids who haven't so far had this experience, and then let's stand back and see what happens. <laughs> because this machine and the software had been designed really for younger children, for, you know, 5 to 12 or something like that. And so we did this and then went on a little walk around the playground of the school, the field, and came back about 10, 15 minutes later and the decibel level in that room had gone way up. Kids teaching kids and there was just an excitement about it that was really a pleasure to see. And uh, later on we uh, then um, took these machines, that had the kids take them outside and they were sort of, you know, sending messages to one another since these machines communicate with one another. They were having a lot of fun with that. It just gave me uh, renewed faith in the idea that kids can learn very fast, um, perhaps in need with the help of a teacher, though not always necessary, um, but this machine was certainly in giving these kids a new experience. That seemed to work pretty well in this one very remote school in the western islands of the Solomons. I then um, came back here and said to my colleagues, Nicholas and the others in the Laptop Per Child project, uh, they were focused on Rwanda and these other places that I said, I said, but let's, let's take some machines down to the South Pacific, you know. So they said, well, there's no genocide down there. I said, no, but there are a lot of kids who are very disadvantaged and remoteness in, in, this, in the Pacific Islands is like remoteness in a desert. You know, you've got 
water instead of sand between very remote villages and and uh, so I was uh, given 5,000 of these XO machines to take down to the South Pacific that came from the um, Give One Get One program where they had sold about 90,000 I think of these machines and um, in this Get One Give Give One Get One program and there I was given 5,000 of these to take down, distribute around the Pacific Islands, which I did. The big problem in the Pacific Islands is the places like Papua New Guinea, which has got a population of, um, well, in the 70s when I left New Zealand, population of New Zealand was 3 million, population of Papua New Guinea, 3 million. Go back there now, population of New Zealand is 4 million, population of Papua New Guinea, New Guinea six million. So the whole population just takes has taken off um, because there's all these teenage adolescent girls who have no future except having babies. And the population has gone to skyrocket. The only thing that will stop that is education. So in various places around the world it's the, the two the, the things that are missing are first of all contact with the rest the isolation is a, is a big problem and the other thing is um, providing these young um, creative minds um, to get into something that has to do with education so you've got to provide educational um, resources for these to, to stop the growth of what they either you know, have big families or they become terrorists or something like that it, it's it's the same thing. Education is the only thing that will stop those things. And there will be a problem visited on the rest of us in this world before we know where we are. So education is the solution. And that's why I'm at this point, having retired from MIT, I'm very devoted to the education of um, the people in the South Pacific. Um, I've taken it from Solomon Islands. Into the, first of all, I spent three months in Papua New Guinea, which is the big problem, as I was just describing but also into the outback Australia, where there's a whole population. There's about oh, something like a million Aboriginals there who have essentially been just left behind. And you've basically got there a first world country with a, um, I suppose you might say, a third world or fourth world appendage um, that's just not being catered to properly. And so I've devoted a lot of my attention now to aiding and abetting this, the education of the remote kids. It's not ethnic. It had nothing to do with ethnicity. The poor performances on the NAPLAN, that's the um, sort of uh, literature and, and numeracy and literacy uh, sort of testing in these around the whole of Australia, uh, show, it shows up that some of these communities do very poorly on the national, um, the NAPLAN scores. But as I say, it's got, it's nothing to do with it, uh, with ethnicity, because these um, Aboriginal kids are as bright as buttons. Um, it's remoteness. That's the problem. And in a place like Australia, you can imagine remoteness can be pretty severe. <laughs> you know, where these kids are living in little communities that are 100 miles from the, next, from the nearest community. And so this is where technology can get in and enable them to become part of this one world before it gets too far away from them. So how are some of those kids using the C-Sound on those, those computers? Um, well, the, there are some things that have come out from the public C-Sound community of um, a group up at, um, in Toronto, um, or in McGill actually, um, have come up with um, a, a little set of things called Tam Tam, this, this sort of little um, interactive systems that the kids can use and they get sounds back and they can have some sort of control. Do a little bit of composing but um, it's more sort of signal processing, patching things together. They don't, so they're not really composing with scores so much. Um, what we've done here at the Media Lab is to come up with another thing called the music, a music painter where kids are given a canvas and uh, they can draw on this canvas and draw faces and image and patterns and things like that and then hear the sound back. And that's, now that happens to be running my C sound as opposed to the public C sound. Well, it doesn't make very much difference. 
But when you give children um, capacities to do that, to be creative and come up with sound structures and, and paint things in the sp with using spatial graphics, and then hear that sound back and get a sense of how space relates to, to time, then they're into a learning, interactive learning environment. And uh, that's nice to see them doing that. So we're um, kind of running up against like, the clock here. Uh, there's some other kind of big topics, things about um, kind of music at MIT. Um, there's a quote here from um, MIT President Howard Johnson back in 1971. Um, he says, at MIT we have disagreed with those who think that the culture of the arts and the culture of the sciences are separate and inimiscable. We find a positive value in, in an educational program that seeks to give students an opportunity to understand and appraise, appreciate, and in fact perform in something substantial in the arts as well as the sciences. Um, can you just talk about um, kind of the, the musical and uh, yeah. kind of um, it was a nice, <coughs> pleasant discovery for me when I first came to MIT to find that the the arts were being seriously considered and uh, and taught and so forth. Very different. Arts and humanities, for instance, at Caltech were sort of very low on the totem, totem pole there. Here they were given a lot of support. There was um, an academic credit. In fact, the students in general were required to take one arts course each semester, arts being arts and humanities, history or something, and music became just one of the options. And it was very nice to see that. Moreover, the typical student here, Typical one, perhaps coming from the Far East, uh, from from the from the East, from Japan or someplace. Oftentimes, those kids were very good violinists, coming out of that culture. They just happened to be also extremely good at nuclear physics, and that was clearly going to be their their main location. But they maintained their interest in in and um, practice of uh, of music, and that had led. Uh, MIT to um, support the the growth of the music department here and the growth of music programs, the Chamber Music Program, for instance, where you've got 150 kids every semester are involved in, in chamber ensembles, string quartets, and so forth. You've got a symphony orchestra, etc. And MIT administration has seen fit to support that because they believe that's very much part of the rounded scientists to have opportunity to be expressive and to perform, be part of the cultural environment. And that hasn't always been the case at a lot of universities and so I think uh, to MIT's credit they have sus sustained the, the music programs here uh, very well and that's often a surprise to other people to, to feel that MIT which is regarded as a technical place has, has had such a, a um, an active music program here and that's always been a nice thing for me to observe and a lot of the kids who came through the early experimental music studio had come from music courses and it just was sort of doing something and writing for um, computer as just an extension of their own experience in the music programs here. So um, as you look back at your career starting out as a, as a composer and moving into um, engineering and you know, software development, how do you kind of look back at that is from your perspective now? Oh, would I do the same thing again? Um, probably, yes. Uh, I've often felt that I would just like to, as I've got heavily involved in something, I would just like to run away and write a string quartet. But uh, I, while I certainly could have done that and done less of the technical stuff, um, I turned out not to have written many string quartets these days. Um, as I started out saying, it is nice to have, it's rare, but nice to have people who are, sort of feel some affinity and, to and competence in both areas of uh, both the arts and the, and the sciences. And that's sort of what we've tried to do here. Um, it's rare that you find someone who is really good at both. And someone you usually find is good at one and, and not so good at the other, um, but it takes both kinds. In the end, what you basically have in this whole total environment is you have system builders and system users. And uh, that's sort of the way the world divides into two capacities. 
two territories and I suppose I've become a system builder rather than a user of my own systems. And I, But I have always encouraged other people to use the systems that I've developed and I've encouraged those you know, by running summer workshops and finding um, um, support for composers, commissions for composers and I've just always believed that the world should have access to whatever the technology has uh, of this day and age uh, has created mm -hmm. and uh, rather than just being um, um, technology for the sake of technology or for the sake of other bad things I think our uh, as as uh, artists our obligation is to have the computers um, create music rather than do war games and that's sort of been my philosophy all along I think mm -hmm. Do you have any future plans for writing some more music? Not immediately. I don't really have. I mean, now that I'm living for the most part in Australia, I don't even have a piano in my house. <laughs> um, so I haven't immediate plans to do that, no. But mm -hmm. I'm now, for the moment, living in my house here in, in out in um, Natick, where I do have a nice piano, and I've I'm surprised at how much I'm actually playing that these days. I know that um, you're, you're not so much, um, you know, kind of currently involved in uh, the computer music community. But uh, what are some of the um, what are some central kind of problems that you would like to to see um, um, you know, tackled as far as you know, computer music and, and you know just furthering furthering the, the course of, of music. Um, what what would you like to? Uh, what I would like to see is more people who are musically adept and musically sensitive to things getting into assisting with the technical de and technological development. I think there's a big opportunity for people from other countries, not necessarily the U.S., other countries that now have the, uh, a fairly mature. Um, technical environment to actually get in and do the sorts of things that I've done. I'd like to see, for instance, my own country of New Zealand, I'd like to see that happening in the universities. It hasn't much happened to date, but I've just gone through a series of lectures to some of the major universities in New Zealand, encouraging them to do this. And so why don't you guys get in and, and write some, some new fascinating code or something and have the computer do some really amazing things that satisfies your creative and, and expressive needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the sort of thing I'd like to see continuing. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible that there's a kind of sound synthesis that's, that's not possible now that could create some sounds that we really have not heard before? Or do you think that, um, that um, future techn technical advances We'll be dealing with kind of the, the sounds that we've heard. I just wondered if there's some new dimension that we I'm not, not fascinated with new sounds. I'm fascinated with processes that will take sounds that we are familiar with or can recognize and sort of modify them so that we can understand the modification. But just new sounds coming out of the blue don't particularly fascinate me. I'm rather more fascinated with the tra the transition of sounds, the modification of existing sounds into another sound, and say, wow, these somehow relate in some capacity, but just the discovering of new sounds has no appeal to me, actually. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I mean, because that's not musically motivated. I think modifying a sound to, be, to go from one kind of sound to another sound has sort of an evolution to it and can be part of a musical motivation. Just coming up with a new sound from out of the blue seems to have no cause or need to exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's so interesting about your work is you're, it's always based upon a, a, a musical and a human premise, and that you're not looking for computers to um, to replace place um, humans. Um, and as as we all know, computers are uh, more and more you know, a, a part of our, our everyday lives. Um, and some people even have this idea that music is only something that comes out of a loudspeaker. Um, mm. They don't even mm -hmm. you know, think about kind of, um, you know, kind of a human performance. But I know that for you, the, the, the human you know, aspect of, of musical performance 
is really important. Yeah. Give me your thoughts well, about this. Well, yes, um, Marvin Minsky has developed a sense that um, music is perhaps a bug in the way in which the humans operate, and um, uh, I can't subscribe to that. I'm so much in love with music of different cultures, not necessarily the, the one culture, but for instance, in the case of music that's come out of uh, my own sort of heritage, which is basically English, I suppose. I'm still very much in love with uh, 16th century choral music of the um, or some of the 15th century chansons out of Europe. Um, some of my favorite composers, Bunoir, Bachoir, and people like that. Yeah. Um, I just love those composers to death. I mean, it's, uh, I just love hearing that, and that's, those are the kinds of pieces that I will put on at home and listen to, more so than anything that's highly experimental, which I suppose becomes a bit more, bit removed from the humanistic aspect of, of who we are. I just find that some of the earlier music, uh, when there's a, a in it, a mature tradition, as happened, you know, in the as I say, in fit with the 15th century on the song, or the six, late 16th century um, composers or something, um, middle of the Baroque, well, and then of course Bach um, later. Um, I do appreciate all those, but I have a rather universal universal view of, of music, and it doesn't have to involve technology at all mm -hmm. to please me. Mm -hmm. So with uh, my friend Marcus Thompson on the music faculty here, I mean, he and I are both sort of closet um, Renaissance choral uh, performers. You know, we, we, that's what we li like to listen to. So we often go to concerts that when they're together, uh, to hear something when this, the um, Talas singers are in town. We'll go to that, for instance. Do you ever sing privately in the, the two-part Renaissance stuff? Um, I always use the two-part Renaissance things the, the, um, uh, in my teaching of counterpoint. I still think my teaching of counterpoint is my, 16th century counterpoint is my favorite subject, remains there. Mm -hmm. But with Marcus, have you ever sung any kind of stuff with him? Uh, no, we haven't, actually. Uh, I no. just wondered. Uh, yeah. But um, I'm a big supporter in the continuing the choral tradition that came to New Zealand through the, um, I suppose, the English choral schools. There's a uh, one choral school in New Zealand. It's down in Christchurch. It's a copy of the sort of the King's College Cambridge, or maybe it was Oxford, the... the um, Christ College in Oxford um, that uh, has continued this at real call school where kids go and sort of part of the education is you know singing in the in the cathedral choir and I've had an experience in the last year when 12 months ago 13 months ago uh, Christchurch suffered a huge earthquake that took down the cathedral along with most of the rest of the town and I have come to its rescue in a way by immediately <clears throat> doing something to try to keep the choral tradition going, try to keep people leaving town, which is the worst thing that can happen to a city when people pick up and move somewhere else. So I've actually created a scholarship there for um, choral for, to send the, some of the members of the um, choristers in the cathedral choir in Christchurch to cathedral grammar. And uh, sort of that's my that was my way of responding to the earthquake. I decided giving money to uh, for bricks and mortars. Bricks and mortar was probably the wrong thing to do at this day and age since they're still having tremors. But doing something that will sustain the, the choral music in, the, in that city is something that I feel very dear to and I've taken a big part in that. I visit there quite often.